This week's episode is kindly sponsored by World Anvil. Stick around at the end for more information. Hey everybody, Daniel from Space Dock here. Now, have you ever thought about the legal implications of somebody like Han Solo being able to have laser cannons on a spaceship? Or how things like space pirates with powerful fighting ships are ever allowed to become a thing? It's interesting to think about how different sci-fi settings deal with sort of gun control as regards to armed spacecraft, and the level of military-grade equipment that civilians can buy for their ships. If you think about it, a lot of major sci-fi franchises can be interpreted as a kind of massive disaster waiting to happen. Captain Rios in Star Trek Picard has La Serena, which is a Star Trek-style ship owned by a civilian, and as we well know, Star Trek-style ships were talking antimatter reactors, weapons that can lay continents to slag from space. It's very much the equivalent of somebody in today's world just having their own nuclear submarine. And it's interesting to think about how this can be allowed to happen, and whether it can actually be prevented from happening. I've always been quite amused by the fact that the uh, Corellian Engineering Corporation ships in Star Wars, like the YT-1300 and the VCX-100 and stuff, are all basically armed to the teeth and equipped and framed more like combat vessels than freighters. The Ghost from Star Wars Rebels is simply a gunship. The thing's got torpedoes and we see it basically cut an Architens class light cruiser in half in one episode. It's far better equipped as a gunship than it is as a freighter. It's covered in gun turrets, hasn't actually got that much cargo space. To the point where it makes you think maybe CEC just makes these things in the full knowledge that they will end up in the hands of pirates and smugglers. Kind of like uh, Drake Interplanetary from Star Citizen, who are just basically a front for designing ships for pirates. It's possible that the scale of space would simply prevent any kind of control of this sort of thing. It's also worth mentioning that harsh control over whether or not you can have weapons on your spacecraft might be rendered pointless by the fact that the ship itself is a weapon. To quote, of course, the uh, the Kazinti lesson, a drive system's effectiveness as a weapon is in direct proportion to its effectiveness as a drive. Once you've given people spaceships that can go faster than light, once you've given people spaceships that can go much slower than light, you've already given them something that they could crash into a city and kill hundreds of thousands of people. You've already given them capacity to create devastation on a far greater scale than any civilian in today's world has. So maybe once you've crossed that threshold, there's no point policing whether or not they can have a few guns on it or not. There's actually a quote in one of the Star Wars X-Wing books where Corrin Horn actually describes the specific legal requirements of weapons on a ship, claiming that in private ownership, a ship the size of an Imperial-class Star Destroyer would be allowed something in the order of two tractor beams, ten ion cannons, and ten heavy turbo laser batteries. Which sounds to me incredibly generous. Ten heavy turbo laser batteries is more than enough to completely lay a planet to waste, and apparently you can have this with no paperwork on your civilian freighter or whatever. It's kind of the equivalent of being allowed to install like a 12-inch naval gun on your Toyota Hilux or whatever. I think the best explanation for the prevalence of armed spacecraft in a sci-fi setting, especially when you need armed spacecraft to be accessible to civilians for story purposes, is that simply the scale of space has made enforcement something that just can't be done by a larger authority. Uh, Something that we've done in the Sojourn is basically just continue to see space as the Wild West. In fact, well, the best allegory really, we we base most of the Sojourn's world building on the Age of Sail, the 17th and 18th century Age of Sail. And one of the things that we bring over from that is the kind of situation that existed there with pirates and privateers and smugglers, etc. Where basically military grade equipment, which you have to understand at the time was basically just cannons and gunpowder, can get out of the control of governments and be impossible to keep tabs on. And you think about how this kind of thing starts and how piracy starts to happen. If there's a single ship moored at a dock somewhere, and a bunch of criminals run on board, kill everybody, steal the ship and sail it away. Then they've got themselves a crappy little fishing boat. Then maybe they go and use that crappy little fishing boat to storm and take over a smaller little boat somewhere. And they keep doing it for months until they have ten little boats. And then they swarm something bigger and take that. And they keep doing this until they get their hands on a small warship. Or they capture a bunch of merchantmen that all carry a small amount of self-defense weapons that they're allowed within the confines of the law, and then redistribute all of those weapons to put them on the same ship to make a more powerful vessel. Often, once they've been used to capture a more powerful flagship, like a stolen warship, pirates of the day would basically split the money and split the ships at this point and give all of their subordinates some of the ships, salvage and scrap some of them, 
because of course big fleets are conspicuous and not what you want when you're a criminal, and then they all just get distributed and trickle down into the system and fall into the hands of other criminals and stuff, but the original pirate now has a better flagship, and that means when they start the process again, they can do all the beginning bit much more easily, they can capture all those civilian ships much more easily, and maybe at the end of the second run round, they get themselves a bigger military grade ship that they've stolen. Until eventually you end up with people like Blackbeard who had the Queen Anne's revenge with dozens of guns that could easily stand up to naval warships. You reach the point where pirates can find far-flung settlements that are too far for a ship to respond to in time and just sack them or hold them to ransom. And I feel like a lot of this kind of Wild West unenforceable nature would come back in the vastness of space. And the more an authority sends naval ships to try and crack down on piracy, regardless of how successful they are, at least a couple of those naval ships are going to end up in the hands of pirates. Or even just a few of the guns from those naval ships could end up salvaged and bolted onto pirate ships. And no matter what you do, it's almost impossible to crack down on this without giving them more equipment. And it just persists through generations until eventually it's completely out of control. And piracy has just become part of spacefaring life. They'll do what they can to protect you against it, but there really isn't much cause to not sell people armed ships anymore because there's enough of them out there already. And again, it just becomes like the Wild West. You can find a gun or buy a gun and use it to protect yourself because you're so far from civilization that nobody else is going to do it for you. And I'm not sure if the scale of space would ever permit a spacefaring civilization to ever become as secure as modern Earth is today. These days, pirates and criminals can't get their hands on US warships or whatever because we have explored the world, we've settled the world, and we have travel speeds relative to the size of the world that are good enough to respond to this kind of thing and make sure that it's completely out of reach of anyone like that. But you zoom all the way out and you increase the size of the gaps between civilization and pockets of society, increase the number of places where you can get ambushed, increase the latitude that criminals have to amass a little bit of power just enough to seize a little bit more. And this kind of thing could slip out of control of a large government body very, very easily. So yes, while at a glance it is kind of astounding that anyone in Star Wars or Star Trek with a bit of money can buy themselves a spacecraft that they could use or weaponize, whether it's armed or not, to inflict horrific devastation on planets or on installations or whatever. And it initially seems kind of silly that they are quote-unquote allowed this, but it seems to me that it might be a sort of inevitable result of any kind of future society where civilians are allowed to travel in vessels they own themselves, especially settings that accurately depict the scale of space, so this kind of thing can't be policed by instant travel and constant oversight. So yeah, if you're writing a sci-fi setting or you're trying to justify for a tabletop board game session or something how your civilian hero team can have a ship that's armed to the teeth. Maybe it's not all that unrealistic that something like that would simply be allowed on account of there not being much of an alternative. Either way, it's food for thought and it's an interesting topic. If you are a writer and this video has been of any use to you, then another thing that might be of use to you is World Anvil, which is this week's sponsor, which I have just rather elegantly segued into. I'm sure you'll agree. World Anvil is essentially a suite of world building tools, which you can use for a whole host of things in creating your fictional setting. You can create sort of wiki style articles on various topics, all of which are very cleverly linked together in a very seamless system. You can even create interactive maps of fantasy settings or terrestrial settings of any kind really. There are very handy systems for creating timelines which is an extremely useful thing in world building I've often found and it just keeps it all in one really convenient place that doesn't require endless piles of spreadsheets and various other documents making it all super easy to dip in and out of whenever you're working on the project. They've even now got an RPG campaign manager for tabletop folks and there's a full suite of novel writing software if you're a novelist. It really is a great place for up-and-coming writers and creatives and a great way to turn a lot of the sort of tedious organizational stuff into into something quite fun when you're getting your project off the ground. And more than that, I would say it contributes to helping original fiction writers get off the ground, and for the science fiction genre especially, that's something we desperately need, where I think massively oversaturated with regurgitations of Star Wars and Star Trek, and I'm very, very happy to support a website that really, really helps new original fiction writers get off the ground and start working towards getting their fiction out there. You can even monetize some of your content on World Anvil, if that's your ultimate goal. So please do go and check it out, you'll be supporting Space Dock, you can find the appropriate link in the description below, and many thanks to World Anvil once again for sponsoring this video. Thank you all for listening, this is Daniel from Space Dock, signing off.